what we're going to do is we're going to start off by having a little bit of a um, a little bit of a think about where does kind of non-truth, post-truth come from? Like what are some of the intellectual roots? So very quickly, we're going to start off by looking at Michel Foucault. You've probably come across him. He's a French philosopher, literary critic, and his work addresses power and knowledge and how those two things form and how they're used as a form of societal control through institutions. He pr pretty much is like the big daddy of post-modernity and the, one of the kind of driving intellectuals behind what we're seeing in non-truth, post-truth kind of contexts and cultures. Um, here is a, an extract of his work. Um, he writes that truth is a thing of this world. It is produced only by virtue of multiple forms of constraint and it induces regular effects of power. Each society has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth, that is the types of discourse which it accepts and makes function as true, the mechanisms and instances which enable one to distinguish true and false statements, the means by which each is sanctioned, the techniques and procedures accorded value in the acquisition of truth, the status of those who are charged with saying what counts as true. So one of the big things is that first, that first line where he says that truth is a thing of this world. It's a thing of this world, which is why it is a tool, which is why it is a social construct, which is why it is subjective, which is why it is used for power. It's a thing of this world. There is nothing out there to know. It is purely a social construct. And so in that sense, truth isn't something that is discovered. Truth isn't something that is revealed. Truth is something that is produced. It is produced as an effect of power by a regime of truth. It's a discourse. It's things that you make function as true. It doesn't mean that there's something true there to be known that you can discover or be revealed. You make it function as true. Techniques and procedures, these are tools. These are kind of masks of power. Um, different techniques that people use in order to further their own agendas. It's about status and it's about what counts as true. He goes on to say, Foucault, that it's not just negative. So power isn't just a, a negative, a destructive force that constrains. He actually goes on to say that power also produces. There's a constructive element to power. And here he says that it produces reality. Power produces, it produces reality. It produces domains of objects and rituals of truth. The individual and the knowledge that may be gained of him belong to this production. So all you are and all you know is the production of this particular regime of truth, of power that produces the reality, the world in which you live. So here is, is, here's a brief summary of some of the, um, some of the main themes from, from Foucault that we now see in post-modernity, in, in non-truth contexts, post-truth contexts. Um, we could use those interchangeably. And that is, there is this rejection of absolute truth. Because if truth is just a thing of this world, everything is just down here. There's absolutely nothing up here. There's nothing up here to access. It's all down here. There's a rejection of anything that can be known outside of this world, which then necessarily entails, as you said, this emphasis on subjective experiences. It's about what I know to be true, what I produce to be true, and how I find meaning um, in my own life. And that is a common theme in post-truth just generally, isn't it? You know, when facts and reason no longer persuades, appeals to feelings and emotion, experiences, does. That's what, that is what works. That is the tool. And so appeals to reason are therefore restrictive, which leads to this skepticism, this sense that you cannot know either way. It's not that... You know, it does reject absolute truth, but it also ushers in this sense of, well, we, we can't be sure really either way. So if someone has an absolute truth claim, fine, great, that's good for you. I can see how that works for you in your life. I can see how you've produced that. I can see how that's a helpful technique, how that is a helpful kind of advantage to you. But, you know, I'm, I'm just not like that and, that. and that's fine. And so there's this kind of skepticism that you cannot know either way whether or not there is this meta-narrative whether or not there is this kind of grand arching um, story to life about our origins, about our purpose, you know, about our ends. You just, you, you can't be sure, you cannot know. So we see this in lots of ways. I'm sure you can probably think of many examples um, for yourselves. Something that I've been reading recently, I don't know if you've come across the magnificent author, um, Ian McEwen, and he's written this book called Machines Like Me, where what he does is he, 
he kind of takes this um, and he applies it to the human, the human desire for progress and particularly seen in transhumanism, that, that human desire to become more, to be more, to create more, but to create more of yourself. And he writes that it was this religious yearning, it's a religious yearning to be more, um, granted hope, to confront or even replace the Godhead with a perfect self. But the mind that had once rebelled against the gods was about to dethrone itself by way of its own fabulous reach. So here he writes about how our minds, our, our, our reasoning, our intellect, our, our ability in order to know and to understand the world has rebelled against God but in its attempt to become superior to God, it actually dethrones itself because it leads to such destruction in one's own life. As he then details in this book about um, AI and transhumanism, it's fascinating. But what we know for any, any culture, whether that's post-truth or not, when we rebel against God, we aren't left with nothing. There are no empty God spaces. Nature abhors a vacuum. Leslie Newbigin writes that if God is driven out, the gods, multiple, come, come trooping in. There are no empty spaces. So everyone will be worshipping something. Everybody has a, a philosophical vision for the, a way of life and what that looks like for them. Even, even for Foucault, what he's doing is he's putting forward a nature of reality. Even if there's no... Um, if there's no ultimate reality, he is saying this is what reality looks like. It's something that's produced and made in the material world. And he's saying that this comes with um, how one ought to live. You make your own meaning. And, how, and it comes with an epistemology of how do we know that as well, through as we kind of deconstruct and see kind of the power plays in, um, in different institutions. It's, it's used as something to, to produce power and to keep those in power in power. Um, Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton, um, has this lovely extract in Heretics where he writes, it's simply impossible to be a human being, to put any two thoughts together, to express any preference for anything at all without presupposing a philosophical vision about the nature of reality, the nature, therefore, of the creator of reality, and so in inevitably quite concrete ways what it means to be a human being. So everyone in whatever culture and whatever context will have this um, philosophical vision about the nature of reality. Um, I've already explained it, but here it is kind of depicted as a, I, can't, I lovingly refer to this as a, the triquetra of reality, which is just a fancy way of saying, here's a triangle with interlocking, um, interlocking ends. And at, the, at the each corner of the, this triangle, we see that we have at the top metaphysics, you know, metaphysics just being the fancy philosophical word, word for what is reality, what is ultimate reality. More recently in, in philosophy, it's referred to as ontology, which is about being. And usually that's, that refers to just what is in the material world. It doesn't refer to anything out there, but metaphysics refers to ultimate reality. What is ultimate reality? What kind of world do we live in? Um, here we have axiology and ethics. You know, how, how ought we to live in light of how the world is? How should we live? And then we have epistemology, well, how do we know that? How do we know that this is what the world is like and therefore this is how we ought to live? So all of these corners mutually inform each other. You can't have one without the other. But interestingly, which you may have noticed in, in society at the moment, is that at, at different points in time, um, cultures will here's a postmodern word, privilege, or will raise as superior one of these corners or a couple of them. So if, you think, if we think about today, we think about the nature of being. The being is um, how I self-define. It's what, I, what I'm harnessing within myself that tells me who I am. It's not to do with anything out there in the world or that there is a creator that's formed me in this way. I'm, I'm telling myself this, and this is linked with a very strong ethic of how I ought to live in light of that. But it's epistemology that has kind of been lopped off. How do we know? So let's keep going. So as we've seen, a post-truth world is also a post-justice world. And then, you know, we have this question that, that comes up, at least in my heart, as I, you know, look out on culture and, you know, you see the beauty and goodness of Jesus over here and then you see culture over here, is the question, isn't the divide just too big? You know, if, if that is the way, if optimistic nihilism is the way that many are, are viewing life, 
and we have the gospel here. Isn't that chasm just too big? How on earth do we go about bridging that and, and showing them the loveliness of Jesus? Um, I've recently been reading Simone Weil. You may have come across her book, Gravity and Grace, and I've just kind of been going through it again recently. And I love what she says here. Um, she writes, the world is the closed door. It is a barrier. And at the same time, it is the way through. Two prisoners whose cells are joined communicate with each other by knocking on the wall. The wall is the thing which separates them, but it is also their means of communication. It is the same with us and God. Every separation is a link. Every separation is a link. There is a wall, there is a barrier, there is a chasm. But rather than thinking that that, can, that completely divides us, which it does, it's also the means of, means of communication. It's the way that these two prisoners actually communicate is through that wall by tapping on it. And so culture isn't a threat to gospel proclamation. It is a means of, of sharing who Jesus is. What was a separation is a link. Um, Leslie Newbigin also picks up on this a little bit in, in his work. So it's just quite small. I only read a, a little bit of it. Um, you may have come across Leslie Newbigin as a missiologist. Um, and he writes that at uh, the idea that one can or could at any time separate out by some process of distillation, a pure gospel that's unaffected by any cultural influences is an illusion. It is in fact an abandonment of the gospel. Every statement of the gospel in words is conditioned by the culture. There can never be a culture-free gospel, yet the gospel which is from beginning to end, embodied in culturally conditioned form, calls into question all cultures, including the one which was, it was originally embodied. So the, the gospel calls into question every human culture, but it is also culturally conditioned. And we'll, so what he's saying here is that culture, whether that's non-truth or otherwise, is not a threat to gospel proclamation because there is no pure gospel to present. There isn't this kind of silver bullet whereby if you say it in a particular way, people will respond in repentance and faith. Because the gospel itself is culturally conditioned and embodied, the words, the message that he writes from start to end about the life, death and resurrection of Jesus is articulated in words which themselves are products of, of culture, They're la it's language. So the gospel connects with culture and it calls into question all cultures. So it's not that transcendent truths don't exist, they do exist, absolutely they exist. But he is saying that we cannot communicate those transcendent truths in a way that transcends culture. We are human beings, we're part of the culture, we're finite, we're limited, we're not God himself. We can only articulate with the words that we have in the language that we have, um, the, the gospel. So what was a barrier is a link. Culture is, isn't, isn't a threat as we think about these non-truth um, contexts. What is a barrier is, is a door, it's a separation and a link. So yeah, this is Don Carson saying the same thing again. You know, we need to acknowledge that no truth which humans articulate can ever be articulated in a culture transcending way. But that does not mean that the truth thus articulated does not transcend culture. So these truths transcend culture, they're there. Absolute truth is, is, is there, definitely. But we cannot in our human words and in our limited um, creatureliness articulate them in a way that transcends culture because we're part of it. So for example, I'm sure that there is probably one person in this room that knows, well, at least one person in this room, um, who knows what this says. Um, would you please read this out for us in, in Hungarian? Yes, please. It's so lovely to hear that in my uh, home language. Thank you so, so much. Does anyone have any idea what was just said? Sorry? Do you know Hungarian? <clears throat> Amazing guess. Fantastic. It, uh, yeah, it is. So here we have, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whomever believes in him shall not die, but will have eternal life. So this is a, a truth that transcends culture. But to those of us who can't, to those of you who cannot speak Hungarian, that is a barrier. You don't know what that says. You need someone who knows the language to be able to share that with you. So these culture transcendent truths exist. The eternal son of God does take on flesh. Um, he does walk among us. And if we, he, that God so loved the world that he gave him, that if we believe in him, we will have eternal life. That is a truth. <laughs> that is a phenomenal truth. 
And yet we cannot articulate that in a way that transcends our culture. We cannot articulate that in a way other than Hungarian, than English, than um, Ukrainian, than, than, than Spanish, than German, than Czech, you know, whatever it is, we cannot, um, Slovakian, whatever the, the, um, the language is, we cannot articulate it in a way that transcends culture. So the gospel transcends culture, but we cannot articulate it in a way that transcends it. And so what, what do we do then? Um, we, are, we are part of culture, which is wonderful. So this means that culture isn't a barrier, it's a door. It's a separation and it's a link. And as the eternal son, as he's taken on flesh and walks among us in the incarnation, we see that the way in which we reach non-truth cultures is the way in which we reach all cultures. And that's by, this is quoted in John Stott's The Radical Disciple. This is Michael Ramsey. He writes, we state and commend the faith only in so far as we go out and put ourselves inside the doubts of the doubters, the questions of the questioners, and the loneliness of those who have lost their way. So here we have going out into the doubts, the questions, and the loneliness. And that is often the product of, of optimistic nihilism and many other um, ways of living, is that if you have anything that's so tightly bound like that, what room is there for questions? And when the house starts to disintegrate and fall apart, where do you go? Doubts, questions, questioners. So that raises the question, and how does God then, how does God reach a non-truth, post-truth, whatever you want to call it, post-modern culture? So here we have Peter Lightheart. Um, this is fantastic. He is a theologian, and he's riffing off Genesis, and he's saying God's word is not the end of the conversation, but an invitation to renew conversation. The triune God, the God whose life is an eternal conversation, does not create a world as a stage before he performs soliloquies, you know, just words, he's just speaking words, just monologues, before a respectfully hushed audience. No, God enters the world and humanity to enter into a dialogue. This is why he's created the world and humanity in the world, to, to know them, to love them, to receive them. And so how do we, how do we go about um, pursuing people in the same way that God does? I think asking questions is a fantastic um, is a fantastic way of doing it. We see God doing this in the garden. We see Jesus doing this um, as, he enters the, as he enters into his ministry. And then we see this through, um, through the apostles in the early church who do this as well, asking questions. Because we can ask this because even in the most hardened hearts, whether you're thinking the gap is just too big, even in the most hardened hearts, um, no matter what their belief system or way of life, even there in the greedy, corrupt, idolatrous heart of Zacchaeus with some little interest, in learning who Jesus was. Such sparks of true humanity exist in everyone. Will we have eyes to see those sparks um, like Jesus? So what questions can we ask? Here, here are three questions um, that, that can be quite useful in these situations. Is the first one is thinking, what do you mean by that? So if you're in a conversation in the workplace, um, at home, um, at school, where, or as a student, wherever you are, first one, if, in response to hearing someone say something that you think that is obviously wrong, Ask them the question, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? Move towards them. What do you mean by that? Second question, often the most difficult thing in evangelism is asking the next best question. The, the question that you can ask after that is to ask, why do you think that? Now, this question echoes the second question in the garden, which is about authorities. You know, which voices have you listened to? Upon what are you basing your thoughts? Why do you think that? And then the last question you can ask is, have you ever wondered? So this is a opportunity to kind of gently introduce Jesus. Like, have you ever wondered why it is that the world is the way it is, whatever it is that they were saying beforehand? You know, have you ever wondered why, um, why we all just long for justice? You know, have, you, have you ever wondered um, what you could do with that sense of guilt and shame? Have you ever wondered? And you know, in response to that, they might say, no, and I'm not interested, and that's fine. Or they might say, actually, I have, and you know, I, you know, it, it carries on the conversation. But again, it's an invitation to conversation. And of course, this is one part of um, the threefold dynamic of evangelism, if we view evangelism as proclaiming, defending, and dialoguing, as Randy Newman does. This is, this is one part of that. Um, we could, so on, asking questions is fantastic. Does so many things. You honor and respect the person. It exposes contradictions, clarifies issues, encourages, opens people up, exposes motives, keeps the conversation going because every person by nature desires to know. 
every person. And so we get to basically share, share the goodness of Jesus and help them to taste and see that the Lord is good. This is what we want to do. In post-truth cultures and non-truth cultures, we want to be helping them see that, um, to taste the goodness of Jesus. Just briefly, um, before, we, um, before I share one more thing and then, and then we finish, is I think this is one of the things I've seen recently, um, particularly in, in the shift in um, cultural emphases, is that it used to be that credibility was like the question of the day, questions around historical reliability, evidence for the scriptures, for the resurrection, etc. And that might still be the case in some of your contexts, but more so now because of non-truth, post-truth, post-modernity, however you want to call it, um, more now we have this, the question of how is Jesus relevant you know, to me and to my life? So it's not that we do away with credibility, it's a reordering. So before you'd say, how, um, show me the evidence for Jesus, and then people would say, well, well, how is this relevant to my life? Instead now, in light of this culture, culture shift, we have the question of, well, how is this relevant first? And then they say, oh, okay, well, how do I know this is true? What is the evidence for this? How do I know? In light of this, we're thinking about relationship, we're thinking about reason through questions, personal experiences, acknowledging the complexities of faith. And we don't have time to look at this, but that um, fourth one is, I think, particularly important, especially in light of um, you know, the small but substantial group that are deconstructing um, the faith, and the power of prayer. So what we want to do is we do not draw people to Christ by loudly discrediting what they believe, but by telling, or by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely, they will want with all of their hearts to know the source of it. And this is from Madeleine Longal and Walking on Water, a lovely little book um, um, on faith and art. So show them a light that is so lovely. Um, if you're interested, um, here are some books that I've, I've just loved. Um, one of the things that I'm passionate about is rehabilitating uh, metaphysics and thinking about what is reality, what is creation to the apologetic task. And this book, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Christians, with a slant on C.S. Lewis is great. Um, this one's a bit more academic, but it's talking about existential reasons for God. Like it's answering that question of desirability. How is this relevant? How does this connect with my desires? Um, Humble Confidence by Benno is phenomenal, like an interfaith dialogue. Um, Hunting Magic Eels is really fun. Like if you're interested, Hunting Magic Eels is about recovering the enchanted faith in this skeptical age. That's really good. I've written just a little primer. Um, as kind of like an entree into thinking about some of these questions. And this, I think, is the most cutting edge thing in missiology that I've read in the past, well, that's come out in the past 25 years because it not, it doesn't, what it doesn't do is help you to think about how to answer questions. What it helps you to do instead is think about the contexts and ways in which we, we, we ask and answer questions.